Hey, fiends of the pod, Nate Wyckoff, your host here again, reminding you like, subscribe, and yes, it is hard to come up with these extra little special things for every episode, but like my good friend behind me, Godzilla, I will not stop until every single building in a metropolitan area is destroyed, if you don't like and subscribe. Enjoy, and please go to cultandclassicfilms.com to pick up exclusive cult movies, and also you can subscribe and have them delivered at a discount to your door every single month. Enjoy the show. Cult and Classic. <laughs> Welcome, fiends of the pod, to another episode of Cult and Classic Podcast. Today it is war. We are covering two films from 1988. The first being The Beast of War, also known as The Beast, depending on the release, and 1988's Trauma's War, also known as War. Uh, these are very different films that are both war themed and I can't wait to dive in. Uh, my, I am your host, as always, Nate Wyckoff, reviewer for HorrorNews.net and comedian. And we also have with us the wonderful Mandy Longley. How are you doing, Mandy? Oh, I'm fabulous. And gr- of course. And Greg, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm a spooky ghost for all of the Patreon people. So we can... <laughs> See yes. that, I guess. Yes, Greg Johnson is translucent for this episode. Again, if you want to join our Patreon, uh, not only do you get all of our awesome content, you get videos of us so you can see us discuss these films. You can also see our uh, most of our interviewees as well, like uh, Josh Ganell, aka Peaches Christ, um, Donald Farmer, things like that. And if you donate five or ten dollars a month, which is not that much, uh, Starbucks does not need your money as much as we do. Then you get uh, awesome stuff like autographed custom some trading cards every month, uh, zines every month with different themes that we put out. So a lot of great stuff. So head over to patreon.com slash the cult and excuse me, I did it wrong. Patreon.com slash cult and classic podcast. Don't go to anything else. Uh, we love you more than they do. Okay. So the first movie, I'm really excited to talk about this. This is the beast um, or the beast of war from 1988. This is actually a fan recommendation. Nick, shout out to Nick, sent us an email to cult and classic podcast at gmail.com recommending this. And I'm so glad he did. Cause I think it's, there's a lot to talk about here. Um, this is a, a war movie. It's about, um, it's a, it, it's, there are no American soldiers in this movie, um, even though there's a, an American cast for a lot of it. It is about a Soviet tank uh, during uh, Russia's war in Afghanistan, which um, history buffs and people paying attention to the current Afghanistan conflict that the United States is enmeshed in and, and arguably created, um, the Russia was there first, and they tried very similar things that, that the U.S. is trying, and they failed, and they left. And I, I believe it was Rudyard Kipling, I could be wrong, but I think it was uh, Rudyard Kipling who called it the, the, uh, the grave of armies, Afghanistan, something along those lines. And it's because um, the, it's a very difficult terrain. Um, the Afghani people, uh, the, the rebel factions who don't uh, want to give in to outside powers are very strong, uh, and they're very resilient. Uh, so it is, it is a tough place to try and wage war. And this movie follows a Soviet tank who, at the beginning of the film, obliterates and brutalizes uh, an Afghani village in retaliation to rebel attacks. Uh, and then they get separated from their unit, and they are stuck in a, a canyon uh, which turns out to be essentially a cul-de-sac. Uh, they don't know that in the beginning, but they're trying to get to the Kandahar Road, and they are stuck. So they're being trailed by the survivors of the village, which they ransacked and, and destroyed. And uh, the survivors have one RPG uh, a, a missile weapon that is capable of taking out a tank and uh, several rounds. And they are trying to use that to destroy the tank while the Soviet tank uh, soldiers are trying to survive and fend off the attacks. It's, it's fascinating. It's based on a play by William Mastrosimoni. Uh, and, and he also wrote the screenplay. Apologize if I butcher that name. I'm sure Tad Mastroeni, our longtime uh, 
our longtime <coughs> guest here would probably be able to give me a better pronunciation. It's directed by Kevin Reynolds. Kevin Reynolds is a very well-known director. Uh, most people have seen films by him. He directed Waterworld in 1995. He directed Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, uh, also with Kevin Costner in 1991. Uh, Tristan and He's Old in 2006. It's interesting. You look at his resume and he has movies that are, are critically and publicly lauded, like Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, The Count of Monte Cristo in 2002. And then you have others that are kind of known as large budget flops, such as Waterworld, and Tristan and his old and I will say that Beast of War is a very in my opinion well-directed film uh, the the visuals as well as the audio that accompany a very ambient soundtrack is is truly it, it puts you in a different place especially being someone from the United States uh, I'm in California it's a desert but it's a different kind of desert okay this is some dry parched land it's hot it's it just it it beats down, it's oppressive on the cast. And I think that it works in its favor. I've talked a lot here, uh, just going into that, Greg, what did you expect going into this movie and how were those expectations met or bucked? Um, well, I mean, considering some of the other films we watched, I was expecting pretty much uh, fucking anything. Um, I think I was bucked though because i was ready for something a little more culty and this was this was a real classic this was good um thank you whoever um our listener that recommended it, thanks, it was thanks to nick really good <laughs> yeah um i i thought it was interesting that it was um based off of a play um which since you butchered the uh the last name of the of the writer <laughs> um let me butcher the name of the play uh nanawati um yeah which they actually, they say during the film and discuss, um, I, I'm kind of curious why they didn't keep that name um, for the movie going forward, just because um, the beast or even the beast of war, they never, like, you, you'd kind of think that since it's about this tank, really, they refer to the tank at some point as... Well, it's interesting. They refer to it as the beast, but they refer to it as a beast in the Afghani language. Yeah. So they don't actually say the beast. Um, it does seem like a, a, a marketing technique. Um, and you mentioned the, um, uh, the word that uh, means essentially, it's sort of like, uh, for those of us in the US, the Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, like um, parlay, right? Like it's, it's like, oh, uh, essentially I, I beg for your, your mercy, even though you're my enemy kind of thing. And uh, let's listen to this. This is actually where uh, Nanwati is, is brought up. And again, apologies for my uh, super white pronunciation. Uh, but this is uh, the actor Eric Avari, who is super fantastic. He was um, Cecil and Mr. Deeds, Dr. Terrence Bay in The Mummy of 1999. Uh, he was Kasuf in Stargate 1994, one of my favorite films. Basically, anytime um, a big United States film needed uh, a Middle Eastern appearing individual who had um, sort of a wise man vibe, they chose, they chose um, Avari, and, and it's totally worth it. He is incredible. And I think that he has a very kind demeanor and it plays to his role in this where he is um, a, an Afghani man who's been educated outside of, uh, of Afghan. So he speaks English and he's working as the translator uh, and a soldier in the Soviet tank unit, uh, but he's not trusted by uh, the commander and the other soldiers, except uh, for Konstantin uh, Kovachenko, who is essentially the main character of the Russians. He's played by Jason Patrick. And he's talking, trying to get to know and understand and learn from Avari's character here. And let's listen to this. This is a conversation after they've gotten lost and they've already been attacked by the rebels once. And now they're, they're camped out at night by the tent. It's gone. It's the code of honor. Pashtun Wali. Three obligations. First, milmastia, hospitality. Milmastia. Second, badal, revenge. Badal. Third, nanawate, the obligation to give um, sanctuary to all those who ask. To all. All. You give me a little. What if I kill your brother and you come for Badal, revenge, and I ask for uh, Nanawali? Then I would be obligated to feed, clothe, and protect you. It's incredibly civilized. What is it, Nanawali? 
Nana, what they? So, uh, and again, I want to mention that that uh, speaking with uh, Avari is uh, Jason Patrick's character, uh, Konstantin Kovachenko. And Jason Patrick, listeners will recognize him as Michael from The Lost Boys. So uh, he plays a very different role here, and I think he kind of shows his acting chops. But this is what you were talking about, right, Greg? This this uh, this word that what they title the play after, which is, I think, you're right, much more representative of the play, this idea of asking for forgiveness in the face of, of terror and offense and death, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I feel like it's a much stronger title, but to your point, I think um, it probably was just marketing that, um, you know, this seemingly unpronounceable word to anyone that, uh, you know, finds uh, Tabasco spicy, um, would, would, you know, maybe see a film called The Beast and be like, oh, like, I could get on that. Oh, The Beast of War? Now you got me. Yeah, and it's, and it's The Beast. It's a much more aggressive word, right? And um, I think it set me up, at least, not knowing, uh, not being familiar with the film before we watched it, um, to think that it would be very uh, action-packed. And it's interesting. There are definitely action scenes, and the tension is extreme. But it's actually uh, not an action film at its heart, I don't think. Um, it's really a character play, which makes sense as to why it was a stage play, between these different um, people and how they're reacting to war. Uh, Mandy, when you went into this film, what's your take on, on that? Did you expect something different? How did it come out? I went into this film and the other film we watched this week completely blind. I just downloaded them and watched them. Um, so I had no expectations going in. Uh, I did like how the beast started out with a quote from um, Rudyard Kipling, specifically about um, the women in the war and how they were extremely, like, considered extremely fierce. Uh, and so that kind of set some expectations um, about the interactions with the characters. Um, I, yeah, so I, mean, like, I had no expectations. I enjoyed some aspects of this one, and then there were other aspects that I just, I was glad that they were left in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and this is, for those interested, uh, who, who, Rudyard Kipling, if, if you're not familiar, he wrote um, the stories that the Jungle Book is based off of. Uh, he wrote um, a lot of literature about war as well. He wrote many, many things, a very excellent writer. This is, uh, the movie opens with the quote from a selection from the young uh, British soldier, a poem that he wrote, and this is the selection. When you're wounded and left on Afghanistan's plains and the women come out to cut up what remains, just roll to your rifle and blow out your brains and go to your God like a soldier. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a pleasant poem. Um, and I think that you're right. I think it sets up the mood for this as well. And it's, I, those, those who know me and my film preferences know that I tend not to gravitate towards uh, war films, uh, at least not uh, mainstream ones. And there's a reason for that. I am not a huge fan of the grandiose nationality and that they often put into the honor role of these films. So, uh, for example, and this is not saying anything against the expert cinematography or acting or writing or cast or any number of things about these films, but Saving Private Ryan. I did not enjoy Saving Private Ryan. The reason is because I, I, didn't, I don't buy in when you're trying to do a film that's purportedly realistic the idea that this sort of heavy handed sacrifice that seems small or meaningful is going to be in play. Um, we've all know, I think it's hard uh, for any of us to say we don't know a soldier or someone who's been in some branch of service in this, in, at least in the United States, I imagine similar elsewhere. And it's, it's not that even if you're you know, a good soldier and you fight what you think is a just and good war, um, that sort of gallantry is not what you do all the time. It's, 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 it's a job, right? It's a job and that job often comes with very dire consequences for you and other people. And so when I see a film like Saving Private Ryan and people love it and they go see it and they talk about it and then I see it, I'm very disappointed by what feels like sort of a hollow, uh, false narrative that, um, it's all worth it in the end because this person sacrificed themselves. The Beast really, in my opinion, is fantastic because it bucks that. It's one of those films that says, 
it muddies the water. We really follow two groups of people who are completely at odds in this film, right? You, you aren't just seeing the rebel um, Afghanis from far away and like, oh, they're just, you know, shooting rockets at us and then we're driving away and killing one of them, shooting and back and forth. You go from the Soviets and the tank dealing with their personal issues and their situation and where they're coming from uh, to the Afghani group where they're the ones in their mind that are being attacked. I mean, they, they essentially have been invaded and they're the ones that are in the right. So you get each group's perspective. And when you get those kind of um, uh, combating ideologies, uh, it makes for a gray, muddy water, right? You just can't say this group is in the right, this group is in the wrong. Uh, and it gets even more murky when uh, the film starts to put in all these individual characters with different motives and different personalities, right? Like every single person is, uh, well, all of the main characters are very identifiable in this film, right? In uh, The Tank, you have uh, Patrick's character who's sort of the, um, I don't know if I'd call him a Dostoevsky character. He's kind of, he's like in the gray, right? He's doing what he's doing because he has to and he thinks he has no choice. You have... Um, Avari's character, Samad, the translator, who's like, I'm doing this because I believe Afghan needs to move into the future. I love my country, and I think that this is the way to join the world. I think at one point he says we're a, like a flea on a bear's tail, and the bear being the Russia, but also more largely uh, the Western world and technology, right? And he's like, we have to, because eventually we will die, or the bear will crush us, or whatever. We have to uh, assimilate. And that's his point of view. But then you have um, the uh, uh, commander of the the tank, who is really a standout character here, uh, George Dzunda. And his he's been a soldier since he was eight years old. And this is his life. And he's sort of obsessed with his tank. And that is his world, right? Uh, and it's sort of an Ahab whale situation. And then you have the Afghanis. And you have them um, with one person is like, my family was just killed. Now I'm the Khan, leader of the village, right? And now I have to make the decisions and it's not just me anymore, it's all of my people. You have the woman whose husband was brutally murdered by the tankers uh, at the beginning of the film who she doesn't care what the Khan says, she wants bloody revenge, right? So you have all of these people, it's like you have two groups and then you start to break into subgroups and it just makes the water too muddy to say, this is a heroic act, this is an evil act. And I really enjoyed that about the beast. Um, getting into that, let's talk about that opening scene, right? Cause that's really the most, I mean, it was, they didn't waste any time getting us set up. It's sort of like a Lion King moment in the beginning, right? We see these big open plains of Afghanistan and then we see like these sleeping dogs, which uh, uh, I've heard there are wild dogs in Afghanistan. I don't know what kind they are. They look adorable, uh, but I imagine they're not uh, when you run across them. But, uh, and then we get to this village that's very much what we imagine a village in Afghanistan from United States news stories to look like. It's already, it's, it's been tumbled down several times in its history, but it has people living there, uh, getting water, making food, drying laundry, also shining old uh, Soviet weapons, and then the tank patrolling, right? And then we just get explosions, slaughter of everyone indiscriminately. And then we get this scene where uh, uh, a character who we find out is, is the new Khan's brother before his brother before killed and the other brother becomes the con who says uh who fires an rpg and he misses okay and they catch him and uh Dizunda's commander character uh essentially says put him under the the track of the tank and he will tell us where the rest are and uh, and then with all of his surviving villagers watching, uh, he refuses to say it. And uh, Konstantin Kovachenko drives the tank and crushes him completely. Uh, and, and this is, it's a really gruesome scene. Uh, we don't actually see it, but we see the aftermath. And it's essentially just a bloody mound of flat. It's like a horrible pizza, right? And I don't know about anybody else. But this is the moment to me where the film, probably 10 minutes in, if that, says, this is your message for the movie, and we will carry this out to the very end. Um, and I wasn't sure, what were your reactions on that scene? Mandy, what did you think when that happened? 
first of all, I just moved and my Zoom background was flipped. So, um, and he's a ghost. I'm a ghost. Uh, so I was blown away by the opening cinematography mm-hmm. uh, of the whole scene uh, of just like the opening of the movie. And then I was just really like, um, just like drawn into this world and like trying to figure out like, what is this movie all about? Cause I didn't watch a preview or read anything about the movie before I watched it. So I'm like, who's, who's the protagonist and the antagonist of this movie. And as the movie like unfolds, like even a little bit through this scene, it's like, it's kind of unclear. Like, I'm like oh, clearly the Russians must be the bad guys are like doing this horrible stuff. But like, there's also some like context in history that sort of points out like, well, is like retaliation for other things that are going on. And like, maybe they're looking for specific like players in this theater of war or something. Um, so yeah, it was just like, it was very, uh, it just drew me in. It was um, very compelling. Well, and the cinematography, as you mentioned, it's a huge part of this movie, right? We essentially look at desert and then some sweaty people and a tank for, and there's a one cave that we see at one point, but that's all we see for an hour and 49 minutes. And I personally did not find it dull. Uh, it's very, very well done. And uh, Doug Milson is the cinematographer of this film, also works later uh, with Kevin Reynolds on Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, but also is probably most well known for being a cinematographer on Full Metal Jacket. So this is not um, Doug Milson's first rodeo with a war film, but also, I mean, these big budget films, and he's still working today, uh, it, really excellent work. And I, I think that it it helps set the tone. Um, Greg, what was your what was your take on this first major battle that really sets up both sides right um i mean like like mandy said i mean i think it really sets kind of this um this tone of we have we have a lot of action going on i mean they they are really laying into this little little village and um it it's not um it's not grand though you don't feel good about it you're watching them just blow this place apart and like mandy said i mean you're kind of like well maybe they're looking for someone but you don't get the sense that they're there to really do anything seriously strategic it's just kind of we're gonna wear the enemy down by killing them they're civilians like all of them yeah you believe when the the afghani uh rebels show up there after it's been you know essentially mortared i mean they're firing tank frag shells into shacks the size of uh you know a 10 by 10 room right in some of these cases like there's just they're laying waste to it for really what seems like no reason to us uh and then they catch people and they really don't seem to have a great reason either um but he says uh why did they do this uh the new cons why did they do this and and the the older uh man they referred to his uncle says retaliation and that really is it right like it sounds just like oh well we got attacked back there so our orders are to go and just blow shit up um to sort of eye for an eye and it sort of adds this i mean of course we're talking about um uh uh the it's it's there's you know it's not christianity in this case although we we could probably assume that this the sold soviet soldiers are christian if they are religious uh and then we have the afghani rebels uh who would be a form of of uh uh follow a form of islam and it feels biblical to to those of us in western society right you're in a place that we see most often when we're watching some sort of bible story biopic and uh, and it's eye for an eye. It is a nasty, cruel situation. And you're, but you're seeing, like you said, you don't feel good about it right away. You don't feel good about it. There's no triumphant music. Um, it's not a a glorious. It, there's no. It's not an A team, right? Nobody's like flying off of a building, like ha ha, you know, like oh, what a stunt. It's impossible to watch it and and admire the technicality of it uh, because it's gruesome and it's unpleasant and. Uh, it's uncomfortably realistic. The gore is good, um, but it isn't another, I'm going to, I'm going to rag on Saving Private Ryan, I guess today. Another thing, it's like Saving Private Ryan. It's like, oh, this guy gets shot in the head. Oh, this guy takes his helmet off for one second and shot in the head. It's not that it, I mean, I certainly wasn't there, so I can't speak to it. There are many soldiers who said that it was like that. And I totally understand and respect that. But when we're shown it on film, why are we seeing it? Is it to make an effect or is it for the sake of gratuity? And in this, 
I found it more horrible because what we saw was not gratuitous. It felt much more realistic. It's like there are people who are just wounded and then there are just people who are dead. And yes, maybe that person is missing a limb, but most of them are just dead. And it's really uh, uncomfortable. Um, and it, it looks more like news footage than it does a very slick production. Um, and, and of course, we get this. Uh, uh, one thing I'll say about the realism that, that is interesting, and I'm divided on it, uh, is my wife watches with me. And they made the decision to none of the Soviet soldiers speak with that sticky American version of a, of a Russian accent. Everyone speaks in their natural voice and cadence, which uh, uh, for, the, for the Soviets, um, the Afghanis speak uh, in an Afghani dialect, I assume. Uh, it sounds legitimate to me. I certainly don't know. I'm no expert. I'm sure others would, who know more about it would have different opinions. But the Soviets speak in their normal tone of voice, which are varying degrees of uh, US English accents. And on one hand, I respect that decision because so often we typically see it in, in movies where they try and give them a fake British accent and it doesn't work very well. Like, oh, well, this person has like an, a, a, a Welsh accent and this person has like a central London accent and it stands out to us, but we just kind of accept it and move on. By the same token, I kept having to remind myself that these were Soviet soldiers and not United States military. Um, and I don't know which would have been better for my uh, desensitized, sens you know, desensitized lens. Uh, if they tried to make them sound somewhat Russian, so I would have thought um, that they, I would have remembered that they're Russian or not. Because it does something. Uh, I don't know if you guys felt that way or not. It does something to, to be like, oh, these guys are speaking English in the way I expect an English person to speak English, like an American person to speak English. It made me think that they were just like me, which is more disturbing because of course they are. And Russian people are just like me. And so are Afghani people, like people are people, right? But when we see a war movie, we expect them to have different accents and that way we can go, oh, but they're whatever, you know, they're Ukrainian, uh, that's different than me. And in this case, we don't take that, it's taken away from us. Um, the, the, the Russians who, I mean, 1988, of course, were still feeling the effects of the Cold War. And now, of course, we still have tension uh, sort of renewed with Russia. We're getting this vibe of um, they're just like us. And I wondered, this is a long way to go to this, but I wondered if that was one of the reasons you guys think that this film is not well known in the United States. Because as you said, it's got a fantastic cinematography, very tense atmosphere. And I think it's a very well done movie. Yet. I certainly had never heard of it. Yeah, I, oh, I think um, you have a good point about uh, the accents, the Russian. I actually found myself thinking a lot of those things when I watched it as well. And almost to the point of wondering why they just didn't have them speak Russian like, and subtitle the entire movie. Because it starts out with Af the Afghanis speaking like in subtitles. And then eventually they switch to English and they have like an accent that reminds you um, where their or like their origin, but they never do that with the Russian soldiers. And the only way you really know that they're Russian soldiers is like at the beginning when they kind of comment on that. And then there's a couple of context clues um, and commentary like throughout the film, but it's, uh, I thought it was a little weird that like they didn't even start the movie in Russian with the subtitles and then switch everybody to English for uh, English speaking audience um, convenience. Yeah, I have an idea on that. Um, but Greg, what did, did you, did that affect you at all? Did you have any, what was your take on the accent choice? I mean, I, I, I think I liked it um, when you started talking about it. I think that that really clicked with me that, um, it, yeah, it made me connect with them more. It made me kind of see the Soviets in this film as, they could be like me, they could be like American soldiers. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if that effect would have been reached if um, they'd all had, you know, Rocky and Bullwinkle accents. But um, I think, I think I agree with Mandy too. I think I would have liked it a lot more if they all just spoke Russian and the whole film was subtitled. Maybe it would have um, downgraded how many people knew about it and maybe even less people would know about it. Like you said, it's not a widely known film, but um I think I could have dug that quite a bit that, you know, we 
kind of see um, just another another war in Afghanistan and kind of recognize the parallels on our own without having to be spoon fed it by having them talk just like us. Yeah, that I, I, so then that's why I think that there's benefits to both sides, right? And the idea of having them speak Russian, um, I, I imagine marketing was a big decision about it, but I also wonder if it was more a, a technical choice that was, well, probably none of the cast we want speaks Russian at all. Yeah. Uh, and, and also if we have, I, I think that even, I think the decision to have the Afghani um, rebels speak in uh, uh, non-American uh, language, because they actually are dubbed the whole time. And I think that when, I think Mustafa, he calls him, uh, the Khan calls him cousin. I think he uses some, um, if I remember correctly, some English words every once in a while. I think that that's almost indicative of the uh, cross um, uh, pollination of the West. And we actually, because he, when he uses English words, we don't know if it's supposed to be that he's using English words. It's probably that he's using then Russian words that are just being spoken in English. It gets this weird, like uh, tricky thing. And it's, and, and that sort of makes sense, right? Because that was Stoffa character that the Khan's always arguing with, even though he's on his side kind of is um, what they call a scavenger, right? He's the one that goes, they kill Russian soldiers to take their equipment and sell their equipment. Um, and, and so he's more interested in his own monetary gain. And that's sort of that idea of, um, even though uh, the Soviets at this point were, were pushing for communism, it's, it's really a, a, it's a commercial communism, right? Um, they're, they're still working in the, in the world marketplace and make, people are making money. They're oligarchs. So I thought that was an interesting play. I, my thought on the... It's sort of like when we talked about Videodrome, if, if those of us uh, or listeners haven't listened to our episode of Videodrome and Terror Vision yet, go back. I think we've got some really awesome stuff in there, and those are interesting movies to look at. But Videodrome took place before the internet was known at all, yet had strong connections, I think, to our current internet. And this movie similarly has even more so huge connections to the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan, which is interesting because, of course, this is before the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan at all. But because we're watching it now, I found myself constantly being like, I wonder if they did that because, oh, wait, they couldn't have. They didn't have a crystal ball telling them what was going to happen in the future. Um, but this, m my guess is, it is that this film doesn't rerun on TNT constantly or USA Network because... Um, it has a distinctly uncomfortable message for those of us living in the United States right now. Um, of course, there are lots of other things on our plate at the moment with COVID and our uh, dumpster fire of a presidency, all these things. But when I watched this movie, it made me think, okay, the decision to have them, not just speaking as they normally would in US English, but very distinctly unique accents of English. Um, uh, especially from um, the, the commander, it made me think that they were speaking on a directly meta level to me as an American saying, look at what happens when you go to war. Uh, and the commander's character's name is, is Daskal. And again, that's George DeZunda. And there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's an interesting parallel um, between that, that's drawn by the character of Kovarchenko in this movie because Kovarchenko, the, the plot of the movie is this tank's being chased by the rebels, right? But the big turning point is that the commander starts to uh, turn on his own men, right? He's, he's very protective of his tank. Um, he doesn't trust um, uh, Samad's character. And there's this brutal scene where first he tries to get Kovarchenko to kill Samad. Right, Samad gets. He tells him to get out of the of the tank and check the perimeter because they just have gone crazy shooting uh, and blowing a flamethrower into the dark because uh, they saw twenty five soldiers trip their sensors they'd put out. Well, he tells Samad to go out and check for survivors, and then while Samad is outside, uh, the commander tries to get Kovarchenko to kill him from inside the tank. He says he's a traitor. I know it. I can tell. Kill him, and he won't do it. And uh, when, of course, Samad comes back in, he's like, they were deer. There were no people. You, you killed deer. Um, and that comes into play later because after humiliating Samad 
uh, when he's trying to do his, his prayers to Mecca, uh, he sends him into a river, which one of the soldiers has just urinated in just to throw extra spite on the fire. And then he shoots him in cold blood. And Kovachenko is horrified. And that's that turning point where we see that Kovachenko isn't just unhappy, but he's moving to that point of nihilism, right? Where it's like, it doesn't matter what I do anymore, so I might as well do what I want, uh, which is go against the commander. And it results in the commander eventually tying him to a rock in the middle of the desert uh, and sticking a live grenade under him so that if he moves, the grenade will potentially blow up. And it's a booby trap for the, uh, the Afghani rebels to find who are tracking the tank. Um, of course, he, he gets out. And then he, he uh, says Nanwati to the, the Khan, and the Khan respects that. And then Kovarchenko literally turns to the rebels and says, yes, I will help you kill the tank because I know how to fix and use this RPG. And Which, then it'd be... Um, I, yeah. I wanted to kind of, uh, going back to what we were talking about with them, um, you know, speaking in English mm -hmm. with clearly American accents, um, at the end of the film, I thought it was interesting when, you know, all said and done and Pachenko kind of tells off his commander. And I think he, he literally calls him a Nazi or yeah. refers to them as like the Nazis. And, you know, I, I'm not Russian. I don't live in Russia. I don't know what their feelings are on their alliance with Germany and then Germany's betrayal of them and how they view them, like how we do here in the States anyway. But I thought that was a weird choice to have him kind of like use an example of evil that American audiences would understand. And right. I don't I don't know if uh, if someone in Russia would kind of hear that the same. And that was, you know, one of one of the last lines of the movie or just about. Yeah, so that's and, kind of that's kind of the message that we're ending on. Well, and let's let's listen to this. This is um, uh, the the commander um, George Dzunda's character Duskal talking to um, uh, everyone in the tank that's left. Samad has been killed, and it's it's I believe this this falls pretty much right before Kovarchenko is is uh, tied to a rock. Basically, they're in the tank. It's dark, and uh, and here he's talking. When I was eight years old, defending Stalingrad, I didn't think for myself. When the motherland asked for our lives, we gave. My father didn't think of himself, he gave. My mother didn't think of herself, she gave. My brother didn't think of himself, he gave. My comrades tied a rope around my waist and, and lowered me on top of Nazi tanks. I stuffed Molotovs under, under turret and cannon and then it pulled me up again, eight years old. They called me Tank Boy. I took a lot of Nazi tanks. A lot. So there's this interesting thing, like we kind of get the feeling that he's already snapped a little bit, right? Um, although I think that that's sort of a loaded term because when we say snapped, we think that there's this like on off switch. It's that moment when a character goes crazy. This character is not going crazy to my, this is his character. This has been his character. He is not progressing towards madness. He is this person. Yeah. Um, and this was really interesting because the idea is that uh, Kovarchenko, which again, kind of this, I think Dostoevsky, um, it's sort of like he is uh, educated, unhappy, and he's, he's also got the logbook, right? Where he's keeping record of all the actions of everyone, the demerits, um, the, the accomplishments, um, things that are very dangerous to Daskal, like uh, him uh, killing Samad in cold blood or uh, uh, the, uh, his, his, his gunner who was distilling liquor from the brake fluid, causing their brakes to be problematic in the tank. Like all of these are being written down and physically kept by Constantine's character. And that makes him extra dangerous. And he is now, because he is somehow uh, problematic for the commander, he's a traitor. And uh, he thinks for himself is the big problem in, in Duskal's eyes, right? He thinks for himself, and that's why he goes off on this tangent. And then when you were talking about uh, Kovarchenko calling him a Nazi at the end, it's, it's almost a little more than that, right? He's not just saying, like, you're a Nazi. He's saying, uh, how does it feel 
essentially for us to be the Nazis this time yeah. because mm. they're the invading force. And, um, you know, following blindly then is the implication as he says you're supposed to do as a soldier causes exactly what he was so proud to have fought against. Um, and it, it, it literally just crushes him. I think that that's the moment where the commander, I mean, his tank's been destroyed. So his one sense of like, he, he's so proud of it, right? Like that's his world. That's destroyed at the end, finally. It, it can't be moved. The tread is blown off. And they're left to just wander in the desert, presumably for God knows what, to die, presumably. Um, but of course, the women show up and brutally murder Dascal, which it's hard, to, it's hard to argue that he didn't deserve it. Um, if he just wandered through the desert uh, and we didn't see what happened, it would, at least for my American sensibilities, be a little disappointing. Um, yeah, for a, for a film that definitely wasn't about glorifying war, there was something very satisfying about watching those Afghan women just beat him to death. Except probably they stone him. They were all right? about the stoning. Oh, yeah. They were oh, all yeah. about the stoning. And there, um, and it's interesting because we'll get into this with Tromo's War too, but there is a, dis a surprising amount of parallels between these two films, even though they are radically different films with ra of a radically, diff radically different caliber and genre. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> but it, it really is sort of, I, I like, there's a lot of um, mirrored scenes in this film. Um, for example, and it probably comes from the, 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 its background as a play, which is there's the scene early on we listened to where Kovarchenko is talking to Samad uh, and they're eating bread. He offers him bread and they're eating uh, and they're learning about each other. And, and, and more than they're learning about each other, they're sort of finding this connection between each other. And then Samad's dead. Kovarchenko has been betrayed by his commander uh, and he's been given an uncomfortable um, parlay by the Khan and they're in a cave and he's, uh, and he's given bread. And when he's eating, and he's uh, eating, he's supposed to eat first before anybody else can get it, right? So he's offered bread, he takes the bread and then he and the Khan begin to form their relationship, which is interesting. It's a different relationship than we saw with Samad because they have a different level of communication ability between each other. Um, but I thought it was very interesting because Kovarchenko is the, uh, he's this, he's in both scenes, but he's sort of on the opposite side. He's offering bread in the first one and learning from Samad. But in the second one, he's being given bread and he's teaching, he's repairing the RPG. He's offering his skills or, or granting his skills when asked. And so, uh, that's an interesting parallel. And then we have another one that's even broader, more, uh, less concrete uh, parallel, but I think even stronger, which is the end of the film. The end of the film uh, is, of course, the soldiers, uh, the surviving tank members are, are sent off. The women kill the skull. Um, and then they bring back, they say, sorry, Khan, couldn't do what you wanted. And she's covered in blood and she drops the bloody boots and belt of the commander in the dirt. And he's horrified because for twofold, one, it's gross, but also probably because he's been defied, right? Like his, he's still trying to find his leadership. He's only been Khan for what, like two days? Um, and, uh, and, he, and then Khan is like, he's trying to take uh, to get Kovarchenko to come with him. And Kovarchenko does it first. They retreat because there's a Soviet chopper coming in. And they start to pull him in. And then he's, Kovarchenko stops. And he, he keeps the rifle, the, the Afghani decorated rifle that uh, the Khan has given him. But he takes off everything else. And he waves down the chopper. And they pick him up in a hoist. And he's carried off through the air, hanging there, just hanging there, right? And it's super interesting to me, uh, be, and I don't know if you guys felt the same way too, because I was trying to think, why does this feel satisfying to me? Because it's a very open-ended moment to end a film on. And my feeling was, oh, at the beginning of the film, Kovarchenko is just following orders. When he crushes um, the Khan's brother with the tank, he's essentially forced by the commander to do so. And then Samad later says, you always have a choice. 
you know, it may not be a fun choice. You may not want to make the choice, but you always have a choice. But in the beginning of the film, Kovarchenko doesn't see it that way. He's powerless and he's just going with the current. But then by, he makes this choice in the middle, right, to work with the con and blow up the tank. And then at the end, he goes, he goes and he's physically going with the flow. He is 100% not in control of his ability to do anything. So it's sort of like at the beginning, he's in that position. And at the end, he's in that position. And we're left to wonder, what is the actual change that occurred? Because he made a ch clear choice in the middle. And then at the end, he's chosen to essentially, to potentially go back to what he just was at in the beginning of the film. We don't know. Is he going to go for a discharge and go home? Is he trying to get back to Russia? Is he going back to the military? Right? Because the commander insinuated that he's been insubordinate before and that his next step for insubordination will be prison. So we don't, we just don't know. And that's a really weird moment. It makes it feel so, uh, it made me feel like there is no hope for the situation right? Which sort of goes back to that Rudyard Kipling poem in the beginning. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. oh, you want to do this? Well, here's how you do it right. You shoot yourself in the head because there's no way to do it right. That's the only eventuality. I don't know what your guys' take was on that because to me, watching him fly through the air just completely limp as the credits rolled was powerful and it took me a while to discover why for me I felt that worked. I guess, I mean, my initial reaction was um, opposite of yours. I felt hopeful um, that he kind of, he saw his choice of he could stay there and just kind of live this new life. And that was fine. But he had kind of been doing the same thing in the Soviet army. He'd just kind mm -hmm. of been there living his life. He's still and in he, war, right? Yeah. Like, But if he went back, um, he with the record keeper. So his job is, you know, he's probably not going to change anyone's mind, but he's going to tell the tale of this, this happening. And maybe one other person, you know, kind of gets the message of maybe we shouldn't be in Afghanistan anymore. Um, and kind of that, like he's willing to take the long journey. He's willing to plant the seeds he may never see grow, that sort of thing. And also, you know, we, we we liked him. He was our protagonist, right. and it was happy to see him leave Survive. alive. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's why I took it as hopeful with just the surface level. He's alive. He's escaping. Great. That's that's what we want as a viewer. And then maybe a little bit under the surface of he's making the hard choice to probably get court martialed. I mean, most likely. Well, because we but, don't know the other two soldiers are alive, right? Yeah. So. And they probably are not that far off. So are they going to pick them up? And what are they going to say? Right? Because in one, it looks like he saved them because they were going to be killed by the Khan's men. And then he was like, no, let them basically just let them go in the desert. They'll die in the desert, um, which, you know, maybe a, at least it's a chance. Um, and so we don't know how they're going to paint it because they didn't like the commander by the end either. Um, and we should mention too, uh, one of the other soldiers is played by Stephen Baldwin in a very interesting role. He plays the sort of, seemingly greenhorn soldier who gets injured early on and does the whining he does an okay job but his part is relatively minor if you didn't if you weren't familiar with stephen baldwin's face or didn't pay attention to the credits i don't think you would know that it was him um mandy what was your take on the ending oh like some of the stuff greg said like it is like you know nice to wrap up the end of the movie with the protagonist like going home sort of, um, but it it didn't feel super satisfying because the whole movie was very um, ambiguous or very open about um, what was happening in this war. There were no good guys and bad guys, really. I mean, there's definitely some troubled characters that um, you were not happy, you were not unhappy to see meet their fate at the end. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it wasn't particularly satisfying it had me thinking back to like our high school English classes and I was wondering if one of our uh specific English, English teachers would have painted him as a twisted Christ figure where he was having like his re-rising after several days um away like from one life um like a certain kind of death and then wandering in the desert and then like kind of going off being reborn because well, the imagery Russian is there life. right 
he's right? he's, and he's, he's and crucified like, on a rock yeah. yeah right right and then he's found by these other set of people and yeah and i was just like oh she would have loved to have told that story and and taught that lesson from this and i was never a big fan of that but i did think about that um when like this this particular christian imagery was used um in this film well and i also thought it was fascinating because um the the afghanis when they're when they're following the tank uh and it's not easy for them like it, obviously the people in the tank are like i don't know how they're surviving it's it's impossible out here but they're doing it um but it's clearly not easy um and they're they come across a holy man who's dancing around a fire talking in what seem to be riddles <laughs> and then you really because he's talking about goliath being slain by david and and the khan coming through the desert oh it's david you're gonna slay the goliath and like what the fuck are you talking about and he's like Goliath, and he points, and there's the tank tracks, and they're like, "Oh, it's a good sign, maybe." And they go, and then here's the thing: if I were Kovarchenko, and this whole sequence of events occurred, and I knew it, I would convert to Islam because you're like, this seems prophetic, right? Because he's like, "You're gonna, you know, David will slay Goliath with a stone," and then of course it's the women actually using C4 and grenades that uh, blow up uh, a rock ridge over. Um, the bottleneck where the tank has to exit the canyon and that's what eventually disables the tank and it's literally the stone uh, not the rockets the rocket doesn't work it just it destroys their barrel of their tank and they've already run out of shells it literally is an impotent weapon um, but the rock is what does it and it's super there's all sorts of imagery there but I thought that that was I mean I don't think that this film sets out or succeeds uh, at being pro-religion in any sense. I think that it no, sort of, it, 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 it eschews all um, organization because it's like, look, this country's shit. Uh, the, the Afghanis are not doing well either. Uh, and the, the religion seems like grasping at straws. It's a very, unple I mean, there's so much, in s my favorite scene in this is that sort of like, black irony which is um the tank uh on while trying to lose the rebels they come across an oasis with water and knowing that the rebels will use the water they get their water they get it for the tank and then they poison the water well the rebels one rebel dies but they figure it out before anybody else drinks the water well of course the rebels know this and the soldiers don't the canyon has no outlet so they have to eventually turn around and come back the way they came. Well, at their apex, when they've gone as far as they can, when they realize they have to turn around, they think everything is great because a copter comes and offers to rescue them. The commander says, no, we're taking the tank back. They get fuel from the copter and the copter, which is looking for water, says, all right, well, we'll radio ahead and get you some more fuel. We're out of here. Well, when the tank finally backtracks and gets to that watering hole, all the copter crew is dead because they found that poisoned water supply. So they essentially killed a unit of their own men, um, which, and also they don't know, it turns out they probably did, but they don't know if they radioed in for help yet uh, before they were killed. So it's really the, the, this karmic payback, right? But it's, it doesn't even, it feels like an aha moment, but it's not a rewarding moment for the viewer. Like I didn't, it's not the sort of gratification moment like the reveal uh, and capture, it's not the Scooby-Doo moment where they pull the mask off and you're like, aha, it's just a bleak, how could things get worse all across the board? Um, and that sort of oppressive, it's like the sun in this film, right? The nights are black and the daytime is blinding. And it's these harsh contrasts that make the film seem so oppressive and I think really accentuate these moments where the characters sometimes don't even say anything, they just look. Like, they don't say, like, I can't believe it, we killed our own men. They just look at the dead bodies and are like, fuck, you know? And, and, uh, and I thought that that was a great moment uh, in this film. Um, I don't know. Is, so uh, we're about wrapped up on The Beast. It's a dark movie. I think it's a great movie. Um, I think that there is, there's just so many elements to discuss that there are probably some, the, the, um, we didn't even really touch much on the gender divide between the Afghani women and the Afghani men. I don't think that the movie touched a huge amount on it, but it does give the women sort of a power that their um, male counterparts are not willing to grant them. 
they constantly are telling them to get out. This is not your job. And of course, they're eventually the ones that do the job that the men fail to do. I thought that that was interesting. But uh, to conclude this, Mandy, would you recommend The Beast, aka The Beast of War, to someone and why? Um, I think I would recommend it to, uh, I don't know, like people that like stage stuff. I think I'm going to go and look for this, like if there's a recording of the stage show of this. I think I'd like to see it in that format. Um, it It is a slow, uh, difficult movie to watch. It has very 80s soundtrack which drove me kind of crazy but did help to heighten the tension of the film um so i don't know i guess as usual like to those who listen to this podcast you're probably already fans of odd movies from the 80s so this is right up <laughs> all right greg johnson uh who would you recommend the beast of war to and why um i would recommend it to pretty much anyone i mean it's it's a great war movie that does something different um i mean i'd recommend it if you like something a little more heady hell i'd recommend it if you watched um 12 strong or whatever that chris hemsworth one was where they rode <laughs> yeah. around on horses yeah. um I mean, it's, it's just a good war movie it's something different um i would though add an asterisk to that um something that we didn't touch on i think is it is ultimately a white savior film it's yeah. like lawrence of arabia it's like last of the mohicans it's like the last samurai mm -hmm. um it's even though they're not Americans, it's a bunch of white people coming into a country they know nothing about and somehow using their culture to their advantage and understanding them better than they understand themselves. Um, so take the movie with a grain of salt, but it's still a good film. But that, um, that's a pretty glaring thing in my mind. I, I, I think that that's a really important point. I'm glad you brought it up because I actually – if I could reimagine or change one thing about this film, I would like to see how it would play out with Kovarchenko staying with the tank crew the entire time and not sort of flipping sides. Because while he does have that sort of Christ figure component, and that's what it plays on, um, the idea of really seeing uh, at both ends the Khan and Kovarchenko eventually meet as as opposite figures, even though they're both potentially figures of, of, um, of, well, of purity in a way, right? Kovarchenko is sort of the reborn uh, uh, prophet, you know, um, uh, disciple figure, and Khan is sort of the righteous avenger. Seeing them come to head that way as opposed to flipping Kovarchenko, which is what we want from sort of a pure moment because we're like oh you're a good person don't do this but if we didn't see that uh i think you could come out with something that was maybe even more honest um but that said i did really enjoy this movie and i think that um i i can only assume that it's distasteful to uh, a palate for a lot of people who really want to believe that war is always a positive if we're the ones that are fighting it. Uh, I think that's why it's probably not more well known because I think that it's better than a great many films that are much better known from this from this year, let alone this era. And I also want to mention, um, we, we didn't really touch on it, the, the, the Gunner is played by Don Harvey, who's a very well-known actor. You'd recognize him if you saw him. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's Jeff in Better Call Saul. He was in Casualties of War with Michael J. Fox. Um, he's been around. And then uh, also, um, the uh, the con is played by Stephen Bauer, who is Manny in Scarface, um, and he's he's a in in Ray Donovan is obvious. So he's he's also well known, and, and he did a pretty good pretty good job. I would recommend this film to people who like um, impressive sort of triple uh, A big budget films. I'm, I don't think this is truly a big budget film, but if you do like movies, especially war movies like Black Hawk Down or um, some of these more mainstream war films that are more focused on uh, plot and maybe some history as opposed to um, characters, watch this movie because I think this is a really perfect marriage between the two things. It takes a very interesting microcosm moment in time for the Soviet Union in Afghanistan and it pairs it with really great character work that kind of uh, tries to get at this, um, the, the heart of the human condition kind of thing. And I think it succeeds in a lot of ways. So I think it's a film you'll be thinking about uh, 
long after you watch it. So I recommend it to people looking for that. If you're looking for something light, you won't find it with The Beast of War. All right, so uh, next up, we have uh, a film that is truly the sister film to The Beast. Uh, maybe kidding, we'll find out. We've got Troma's War from 1988. Okay, guys, so Troma's War. Now, uh, for those listeners, I think most of listeners to the Occult and Classic podcast will probably know what Troma is. Troma is the longest running independent film company, uh, and their biggest hit claim to fame is The Toxic Avenger uh, from the 80s. Now, full disclosure, I volunteered for Troma, mm, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago as the Toxic Avenger at uh, the, the Rock and Shot convention in Massachusetts. And uh, they're fun and they operate on the cheap and I love them. And their entire shtick, and it is a shtick, is releasing really bizarre films and producing films that are both highly entertaining and extremely, extremely classless and tasteless. And um, I think this film, I mean, it's clearly a, a trauma production. Uh, I think it meets a lot of those things. Uh, we're going to talk about it. Uh, I don't know, how familiar were you guys with trauma before this? Mandy, did you know anything about trauma? No, I didn't. Nothing. Okay. Trauma, Greg, did you know anything about trauma heading in? Uh, no, but since I knew that this was your pick, um, <laughs> I was expecting some, some, some shit, and uh, I definitely got it. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, I think the only thing we don't see in this movie is actual shit. Um, and, and it's, so here, here's, here's the plot rundown. And there's a lot of little bits and pieces that are going to be lost in this. But essentially, a plane load of uh, American citizens crashes uh, after both their engines fail on an island that turns out to be Cuban territory, where a group of crazy mix of people are running a terrorist training cell and that next morning they're shipping off uh, it looks like 12 15 people who are dressed as americans to the states to systematically sow chaos so that the right-wing government officials in the united states can uh use it as an excuse to uh, put their right wing more of their right wing um uh, puppets into high office in the United States. So it's this sort of weird um, neoconservatives using, uh, joining Russians who are using a terrorist cell mixed with all races, ethnicities, and different things of terrorism to uh, perpetuate a conservative agenda. Very strange. Um, but as we uh, know that the film starts with a plane crash and a bunch of survivors, it is in fact the pilot to the lost television show. Um, and that's, of course, not true. But it's very much like that. We, we open... Well, I was picking up a huge amount of Lost Vibes yeah. at the beginning it, of this movie. I mean, I'm not... It's like a joke, but it's not. Like the, it's so not. Those of us who remember Lost, like, it opens with a plane crash and survivors mm -hmm. collecting themselves and then trying to discover the island. That is literally the beginning of this film, like, to a T. And then they come across the others. Like, it's literally... It's like the yeah. whole first season right. of Lost in, like, 30 minutes. Yeah. Exactly. And by the way, this we watched the uh, extended complete edition, um, which most I think most DVD copies and Blu-ray copies now are the complete edition. It's about 10 to 13 minutes, depending on your territory, longer than the original 80s cuts that came out. Um, the, uh, the things that they cut out originally um, were a couple of gore moments and um, I think a, a rape scene. And for those, I mean, rape is one of those things on film that is just so uncomfortable, just like in real life. It's a really traumatic, terrible thing, uh, and it can certainly trigger many of us. But I will say this. This is not a serious film, so it was hard. It's, with, a tra with any trauma movie, I did not find myself taking anything particularly seriously, even the horrible atrocities visited upon people, uh, both soldiers and castaways, in Trauma's War, and there are many of them. Um, in addition to, to uh, sort of nothing being uh, disavowed by trauma as far as like, they will do anything. They will have murder, rape, pillaging. Uh, Toxic Avenger is famous for having a scene where uh, it's one of the best scenes in cult cinema history where a bunch of punks uh, hit a kid on a bicycle and then back over his head and it shows his head being crushed. And then 
one of the guys says, hey, you want to go whatever? And the other guy goes, no, I got church in the morning. Like, that's the level of, of, of trauma's ability to be like, we're going to show you things that make you uncomfortable and we're going to make a joke about it. Trauma's War has that but I do not think that it is as offensive as some of their other films. In fact, I'd hazard to say this is a movie you could probably show someone who isn't familiar with Toxic Avenger and, uh, and, and they would be able to make it to the end. But it is a long ass cut. It's an hour and 44 minutes. It's only five minutes shorter than The Beast and The Beast has a lot more subtext to cram in. And see, that I, I, I felt the exact opposite. Like the overabundance of, again, like, rape and gore like it, it, it's like any comedian who's like oh well i grabbed the third rail like it, it was it was all for the sake of comedy if it's if it's funny sure but none of this was funny no like, it's not like it was just it was just fucking mean-spirited and, and just <laughs> tasteless to be tasteless and mandy what was your what was your vibe on that oh wow like um i i mean it, I don't even know what to say, really. It's just, it was a bad, bad movie. So, which, which is what we were, were promised. Well, um, what, what's funny, so I'll cut you off on this one thing, is yeah. you, you touched on the mean-spiritedness, uh, Greg, and I would say maybe it's because I've seen some films that I truly consider really mean-spirited, especially towards women, where I think um, uh, there's there's one in particular, which the name will, will come to me, uh, and, and then will be wiped clear uh, from my memory once again. But it, it, it's, it's one of the clown movies. It's not Clown Tergeist, it's not that one. It's another, another direct-to-video clown film where I was like, this is a vile movie because they, don't, they clearly do not understand that they are crossing a line. Whereas Troma, it definitely is a shock jock film. I yeah, do think- I didn't get, I felt that it was just like goofy. Yeah. mean-spirited. Um, they i felt like they knew that everything that they were doing like very tongue-in-cheek like we know we're being sexist so we're gonna like really go go all the way like we know that and they this are is, like, they do gory, like gory ridiculous um like murder war scenes or whatever but like we're gonna make it like it, i don't know if they if it's a low budget aspect of it or if they like intentionally make stuff look goofy uh but like I, that's how it came off to me it was, this was all just like campy for the sake of camp and like dialing it up to 11 just to be extra tongue-in-cheek and like kind of make their point that they know that they're doing it um well, but it, I, mean, I mean but it was still like just bad like <laughs> it was just not my kind of movie so it's still just like yeah I, get, I see what you're doing like that's okay uh whatever like <laughs> What's the next plot point? Is that going to happen like any time? I, I figure we're all kind of thinking about the middle of the film where they capture them and they line them all up and like it's just kind of going down the line. Like, okay, uh, you, you're going to get raped. Okay, next person. Okay, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to get raped. Okay, yep. third person. You're also going to get raped. And then you get to the men and it's like shoot one in the head, beat out of this one. Like it's all these like different things happening to them. But mm -hmm. all the women, they're just like, ah, like throw them into a tent with – some underling or uh maybe the... mcraperson like, yeah. it's uh, like so yeah. the the most problematic part of this film and and the only really famous scene that i can think of and it's really the concept that's famous not the scene is um the the uh, the terrorist aids brigade um and and that is by far the most insane uh completely off color offensive thing and i don't know who you have i mean even if you are someone who enjoys the high level of sophomore humor that trauma is putting out in this film you have to be unless you're crazy you will acknowledge that this is really inappropriate in any setting but they know that and they went with it and the scene is um I forget what he's named, but um, it's something like, you know, Tommy AIDS. And oh, it's, it's Mr. AIDS. 100%. Mr. AIDS. It is Mr. Mr. AIDS. AIDS. And he is a uh, uh, pretending to be a Frenchman in a, a white uh, suit with a hat who is picking a woman to have sex with and infect with AIDS. And he does that. And she does get her revenge by shooting him in the dick with a crossbow before herself getting shot. 
I don't think that that's really a, a full, full turnaround. Um, she, he, he tries to say with this really bad French accent, um, I was following orders. And it, I mean, take from it what you will. It is the weirdest. And that's the thing. This movie has an insane number of weird, weird moments. And that is the thing I like about this movie. Um, for example, uh, the pig guy. I mean, uh, one of the, there's several uh, heads of the terrorist organization, different people in charge. Um, and one of them is uh, a, a character who is uh, a, a pig. I mean, I don't even, mm -hmm. like, he's like a man pig. Like, he's a person, and they gave him a prosthetic nose that could be real on somebody, but we know it's fake because he constantly is showing his nostrils and snorting. And, mm -hmm. and let's just listen to, to a clip of him. Uh, and truly, uh, this actor, uh, his name will come back to me, is doing God's work. Here we go. Want to risk our infiltration trainees who have spent years to train? Yes. Cause the entire economy and all the plans we've been making for it all these long years is at risk as long as even one of those commandos still lives. Yeah, so uh, that is, uh, that is, it's Rick Collins, I believe. Could I, could I just say real quick uh, <laughs> yes. about Rick Collins and the entire cast? Like, man, I've never seen a group of individuals in a worse movie commit this fucking I hard. No, like, I know, yes. Like, I, think, I think I only saw one person, like, clearly break, who clearly was not an actor, but everyone else was, they were 110% on board with their dialogue. Yeah, uh, really though, and and so trauma in this film, as they do with many films, cast a huge number of non actors, um, and but they also pull a lot of people who are actors or want to be actors from from New York t typically. So they get a lot of people's first chance. In fact, you could find a lot of working actors who early on uh, worked in trauma films and went on to great things. Um, and in fact. Uh, Rick Collins, who we just mentioned, who is super jacked in this role. Um, he's actually in many uh, of, of, of Troma's most famous films. Uh, the talk, he's got a bit part in The Toxic Avenger, and then he's in Return to Newcomb High and Toxic Avenger Part 2 and 3. Uh, and uh, for those who think that Troma is just a throwaway um, kind of thing, I'm not saying that you're not wrong in many cases, but I will say that James Gunn, who uh, is a very, in my opinion, one of the best working directors right now. Uh, he's directed the new Suicide Squad film that's coming out. He's most famous for um, the Guardians of the Galaxy series and will be working on the third. And he also did um, the live action Scooby-Doo one and two. So, I mean, he's, he's done large movies and I think many people love him dearly. He came from Troma. So they do put out true talent and i think what you're saying with the commitment is people seem to like working for trauma i know i did even though they uh, definitely work on the cheap i got paid in dvds uh i did not get <laughs> i did not get money um but for a weirdo like me that was i was just gonna spend it on him anyway uh <clears throat> but rick collins snorting i wanted him in this whole movie and then i wanted a spinoff i don't know what kind of weird backwoods like a uh, white supremacist redneck he's supposed to be. He's shirtless with a bondage like brace and then like strips of machine gun bullets that he doesn't use. I don't understand his character. I don't know where he came from, but there's also a bunch of other characters that just run on screen just to get killed that I don't understand. There is a ninja in a full like uh, party city ninja outfit in the group of terrorists at one point. Um, there's one scene where Parker, who is uh, one of the main characters, he's played by Rick Wall Washburn, who's done a lot of, of good work and 100% committed to this film. I mean, 100%. Uh, he plays the um, used car salesman who uh, is not only uh, an ugly American bigot, but he uh, was a um, uh, in the Airborne in Nam. And so he's like their secret weapon. And he starts killing these terrorists and collecting their ears. And he is uh, all over this movie. He commits 100%. And at one point, he's shooting people. And then uh, a terrorist wearing, like, a rope thong 
covered in mud from head to toe, just top to mud, just runs in to attack him. Like, that's just, that, that wasn't, I can't imagine that's scripted. That's just a weird character that just happens to be in here. Um, and it's definitely the the lineup from Blazing Saddles when they oh. invite all the evil people and you see like clansmen, you yes. see Nazis, you see banditos, like the whole shebang. Yes. Well, and and that brings something else about that. Uh, Lloyd Kaufman, who is head of trauma, and Michael Hertz as well. Um, both of them are credited with directing this film and, and writing it. Um, with some other uh, Lloyd Kaufman did the story, and then some some other people actually wrote it, including additional dialogue by several of the actors, including with. Uh, Rick Washburn is people often um, I mean there have been there have been people who have railed against trauma for all of the crazy disgusting things they put on camera the thing that shocks me that people seem to ignore in many cases um, is of course they know what they're doing they're smart enough to run a business so they that's been around for many years so they know what they're doing and they, they're aware of it but also this is the most diverse cast of people Every race, color, creed are in this film. And there are a lot of extras in this film that get great FaceTime. Um, and they're everywhere. Uh, and they're, uh, the, the character who plays the, um, the, the Christian minister that the neo-Nazi keeps calling a Jew uh, is, is a, a person of color. Um, the, uh, I think it's Nancy is one of the punk rock girls. Uh, she's black and she's called the smart one throughout the film. Um, who, by the way, I, I'm not, I don't have a hundred percent confirmation on this. That's Alita Harris uh, who plays that very beautiful actress. She's, she has the um, honor of slicing the conjoined twins in half who apparently are somehow running this although they die halfway through the movie they're connected they're joined at, the at the head they're joined at the they're, head like they're the brains of the operation they have, like, i'm like yeah and i'm like is that a, supposed to be a joke i could i wasn't sure yeah. um but again those are just more weird characters like they throw shit uh, just anything anything could happen in this um she if it's the same person, and I really think it is, but I have not been able to get confirmation, uh, she is now a doctor and a reverend and a motivational speaker. So uh, that's pretty interesting. I would uh, – Alita, if you're listening, please come, come, come on the pod. I would love to hear what you have to say about Trauma's War and everything else. Um, but, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, – there's just a lot of insanity in this movie. Um, it also is distinctly separated into, like, three – I mean, they're not arcs because they don't really flow together, um, but they're three separate films in a way, right? In the beginning, we have a group of people learning to work together like any sort of um, motley crew stranded on an island scenario, right? Like it's that lost moment. They're all stuck. They realize that they're a terrorist and they all start to work together and find each other's strengths. Then there's the, the middle of the movie, which is like a solid 40 minutes of um, them attacking the uh, them getting captured and then uh then being rescued slash demolishing this like second base of the terrorists then we find out they discover the actual plan which is the terrorists are like i said they're going to send like 12 people on a little boat into florida who are somehow going to destroy america i'm not sure how that plan <laughs> worked out i'm pretty sure they would have got to florida and they all would have caught an std and died like Isn't that that's... what we're living through right now though Nate? Oh! Are you sure this Oh, it's a history. It's a history. Uh, disappearing ballots. Um, yeah, no. So <laughs> fair, fair. But anyway, so then they realize that they have to go and save America by destroying this other base where um, Snorty McPigman is. Uh, and, and that's the third part of the movie is their siege on this. I really like the moment where one of the characters, because the terrorists are convinced that this is a, a cell of American elite commandos who just, who are faking it that they're just random civilians. Um, and so they're constantly saying, where are the commandos? And the logic is, is that no normal people could kill that many of their men. Well, they're men that have supposedly been trained, some of whom potentially from birth to be soldiers are absolutely redonkulously incompetent and incapable of anything. Like they just run into machine gun fire, like you were like a, a fat kid in a hundred degree day running through sprinklers. Like, and I was that fat kid, so I can say it. They're just so, and it's, it's just, 
mad melee. Like I pulled clips from this film for us to listen to, but most of the film is screaming explosions and machine gun fire, which does not translate well to an audio only medium. And, and crying babies. And crying babies. That's, and there is a baby in this film which does survive to the end, which I was a little surprised about because trauma really could have thrown a, a wrench in there and said, just kidding. Um, I do want to say that I enjoy that uh, the baby is credited. I be, it's, 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 uh, uh, the, it's Lisbeth Kaufman, I assume related to Lloyd Kaufman, um, credited as the um, jingoistic baby. I don't know why. I'm not sure. Uh, but I enjoyed fucking because I enjoyed I enjoyed that moment. There's, I, I, and as always, I looked through some reviews, uh, critical and um, civilian reviews, so to speak, of these movies. And one that caught my eye was somebody saying, "This movie was ruined by gore and bloodshed because it could have been a really great action comedy." I don't want to know that person in real life, and here's why: the comedy in this movie would be even more insane if it wasn't covered in blood and body fluid, I think. Because you've got scenes like, um, well, first off, after they're rescued, the survivors are rescued from that base in the middle of the movie, there's a scene where essentially all of the surviving people except the older gentleman and the older lady, and I guess a Spanish lady, the accents are horrendous, I can't tell. Um, they all hook up before they go to the final battle. Um, the newly blind woman hooks up with the overweight nice guy, uh, older gentleman. Um, the uh, misogynistic hot guy hooks up with who we're told is supposed to be an attractive woman. She's not hideous. I just, I, it's, she's 80s attractive. I don't know. I don't get that whole feathered hair thing. And then um, the, uh, the, who else hooks up? I forget. There is another group. But anyway, so they all have a hookup before they go to the final battle, which is kind of funny. There is nudity in this film. Um, there are several times, several women are topless in this. Um, and like any trauma movie, I think it's hard to find titillation in this film. Uh, it's not, and not because it's bloody or because it's misogynistic or because it's, uh, it's, it's got AIDS humor, which is just so uh, tough to swallow. It's just, it's just goofy. It's like if a if a per, it's like if a beautiful woman in full clown realness with a bozo wig and parachute pants ran out into the street in front of you and took her top off. I don't know any. I mean, maybe that's somebody's kink, but that is not a normal thing that's going to turn someone on. And that's what nudity is like in a trauma film. So I appreciate that it's there for the sake of selling it and getting it on a shelf at a blockbuster. But I I, I don't think that's a selling point for most people in this case. I don't know how anybody else felt about that. And yeah. None of it was sexy. <laughs> yeah, none none so. of it exactly uh, got me excited. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so I mean, I, and there's, and it's not really. I mean, it's gratuitous by virtue of the fact that it's there. Um, it doesn't really. We've got the the humor. I was getting to the humor scenes. There's this scene where like. Um, because there are terrorists who are men and women, which I thought was a nice touch. Like everyone really is, is included in this. Um, and uh, this woman attacks Parker, uh, who, and she's in like, a, a, she has large fake breasts. And he like pushes her away and her shirt rips open. And then she's on her back and he goes over to kill her and cut off her ear as he's done with others. And then he's like, ah, with a pair like that, I'll let you keep them. And he turns around. And then if she, of course, grabs a gun and goes to shoot him, and she's shot in the back by one of the other heroines. Uh, and she's shot in the back through her breasts and we hear a deflation sound before she hits the ground. And there are straight up cartoon of sound effects in this movie, right? During really inappropriate moments, which is very trauma of them. You know, like a, the a neo-Nazi will hit someone and you'll get a boing, 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 you know, like it's, it's totally out there. And doesn't someone like fart in a tree and that's how they reveal? <laughs> that's how they're given away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and it's not like we just saw the guy eat a burrito. Like he yeah. just happens to be in a tree in like a paintball mask and farts. And it's just, I, <laughs> these gags, my favorite insane gag is when um, the, the, the hot girl and the misogynist uh, guy are, um, they've already consummated their relationship and now they're fighting the final battle um, and they go back to back and then 
He's like, I told you to stay behind. And she, he kisses her on the cheek. He's like, I'm so glad you never listened to me. And then she turns to him and they both have submachine guns. And she, and she like rubs the nuzzle of her machine gun <laughs> against his, the nuzzle of his machine gun. Like, a, like I don't, like, like you're rubbing <laughs> chopsticks together and, and they close up on it. And I'm like, I'm not exactly sure what this is supposed to symbolize. <laughs> That wasn't uh, that wasn't uh, titillating for you. That didn't. I I'm like I, I didn't I didn't get it. And I was, but it was so like the fact that that moment was committed to film was it it really did inspire me because it's it, one thing they did in this movie is I don't think they and I don't think trauma does this in general. I don't think they fail to catch their vision on film. I think that what they do is they're like, well, I want this, so I'm going to do it. And that that's not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, it, I'm going to ha- I'm going to be honest and say it's rarely my cup of tea and there's a lot of stuff that a lot of filmmakers put in things that I'm like you should have cut that. Uh, some editor did not do their job. And this movie it's all of those put together. Um, I don't know if this is one of them, but trauma, as I said, they often do things on the, on the cheap. Um, and when they were, they shoot on film, they would go and buy the tails from other production companies. And the tails were, uh, the, the ends of film reels that weren't shot on. They, they cut them off and they would buy that and they would, they would splice them all together and they'd shoot on that. And so, and I imagine this is probably the case with this movie because the color, is wildly different um, in many shots, um, especially in, in the middle somewhere they're shooting soldiers in the trees. Uh, that's like the farting tree scene. Um, and when they show the tree shots, it's not just that they're staring at a bright sky. Um, the colors are radically different. So it's, I, I'm sure it's a different film stock, which happened. And so the mastering is all over the place. Um, and that is, that does add a flavor that's like, oh, This movie came out the same year as The Beast. These films were in production at the same time. And they are so unbelievably different that uh, I think they both have a place in the world. But I don't know. To me, this movie would be great at a drive-in with all of you with me in the car. Um, Whereas if I brought all of us to go see The Beast in the theater... Uh, dinner afterward might be a much more somber affair. Um, and I, I guess, you know, I don't know. I, I, it makes me wonder, is, is which movie is more to our times right now? Like, if one of these films was to come out today, made, which do you think it would be? I know what I think, but Greg, if, if, if you were producing a movie, which of these do you think would get made? Uh, the one that ends with the entire cast looking at the camera and loudly cheering America, maybe? Yes, that literally happened. Stay till after the credits, guys. Mm-hmm. Um, Mandy, what do you think? Well, I think that um, all of this is a huge conspiracy and believers of QAnon actually made Troma's War like within the last six months. <laughs> well, um, I, uh, I'm pretty sure that Trauma will be putting out... Um, QAnon zombie corona attack in the future yes. and uh and yeah no what's interesting too and let's listen to this clip because I, I described the right winger conspiracy that's part of this movie um and let's listen to this this is um the 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 hunky lead here uh who I believe is Sean Bowen um yeah Sean Bowen and this is his only credit at least his only credit on IMDb I'm not sure if he works in in stage or if he's moved on to other career choices but this is him talking to the other people as he's found a stash of information from the terrorists it seems they're planning a massive infiltration of the united states coast to coast new york to la they're out to kill as many people as they can and freak out the rest of the country in the process and the best news of all is they're leaving tomorrow at dawn so the commies got the terrorists doing their dirty work now we better pick up this hardware, people. We're gonna need it. It's a little more complicated than that. There were papers in there with American names on it. People with influence and contacts in Washington. From what I can see, they're the ones at the top pulling the strings. But wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Why would right-wing Americans be working with Cubans and terrorists? They're left-wing. Okay, there were political papers there written by Americans. They're using the terrorists to accomplish their own selfish goals. What goals? 
the usual ones money greed they want the terrorists to destabilize the country then they're going to blame it all on the communists that way they can get more and more right wingers running things in washington so here's where i start my ears started to tingle when i was watching this scene um because it's a really weird scene in this movie because all of a sudden we're getting exposition that gets a little more serious <laughs> i mean it's still not serious but it gets a little more serious than the rest of the movie and having followed trauma for many years um i i know that lloyd kaufman uh he was a strong supporter of ralph nader um sort of third party politics um a, a liberal obviously um it, it, based on uh being a content creator and um there's a part of me as a white middle class 18 year old cisgendered man who uh was comfortable growing up and always thought this is a little out there, right? Like a, a little wackadoo, maybe Ralph Nader's he's not wacky. He's right. In many cases, seatbelts are great, but he's a little uh, left than even I need to be. And now in our political climate, QAnon is crazy. They're full of shit in my, if you don't believe that and you're listening to this podcast, you don't have to listen to this podcast. You can go somewhere else. There's plenty of other shit you can listen to, but uh <laughs> There, there really are people working against democratic process, things like that. And they tend to be people who have money. And seeing things like this that came out four years after I was born and realizing that a lot of things still don't, they don't change that quickly. Uh, it was, it, it's a weird feeling. It's just a very strange thing to be watching a movie that is essentially uh, a, an R-rated cartoon and then go, by the way, your political system is really fucked up. And then kaboom, boom, you know, like it was just really weird. And I, I don't know if that ever worked to the advantage of making people aware of it or if it somehow cheapens the, the message. I don't know. But I really liked that moment when Parker, the like, you know, Vietnam vet, like, you, you know, anyone who can't kill a man is a, a, a pinko and a, and a uh, you know, and clearly a queer, uh, you know, his words, not mine. Like, that's going, having him go, I don't believe it. And then the, the lead going, uh, yeah, well, it's true. Uh, there are Americans on this list. That totally surprised me. And it surprised me that that, that, that made the cut when really, the rest of the movie is just gunshots, explosions, screeches, boobs, and fart noises. I mean, I, I, I thought it cheapened it. I mean, it was kind of every other word out of anyone else's mouth was utter absurdity. <laughs> so to have anything even like orbiting poignant, I would just, I just kind of tuned out. Honestly, I was like, Oh, mm, more, more, more bullshit. That's, and it's not a joke. So I guess I'll come back when there's something that maybe I can try and laugh at. Good luck with that. Yeah. Um, and, and to be fair, I, I actually did. I didn't laugh at anything in this film. There were a couple of times I smirked, though. And there were tons of times when my jaw dropped open. Um, and sometimes that's worth it. Because if nothing else, this is definitely a movie that someone can come to you and say, man, Cats was insanely bad. I've never seen a movie that bad. You can go, are you fucking kidding me? Let me show you something. Sit down here, son. Sit down here. This was my Vietnam. And then like show them Trauma's War. And, uh, and again, I think that there's a lot of people like it. Now, it's something else we need to touch on. Trauma is kind of known for their low budget gore effects. They're all over the place in this movie. And as I always believe, they're effective. I like their gore effects. They're goofy, they're latex, uh, but they're low budget, but they're super creative. And if you're gonna show me, fun. yeah, if you're gonna show me cartoony violence, I wanna see a severed arm. I wanna see uh, twins connected at the head, cut in half on the floor. Like, I wanna see that stuff. I love stuff. the snake attack. The, sna <laughs> the snake, snake attack. attack. <laughs> so, so one of the characters in the beginning from the plane crash, he never gains coherence. He's just always wounded and bleeding and they're carrying him around. Well, he ends up getting bitten by a snake. And it's a real snake that then becomes a rubber snake on his face, which I appreciate because no animals need to die for any movie we've ever reviewed. And uh, a couple people maybe, but that's okay. And um, 
and and then the this throws us the rubber snake and then we get this great effect of like his face just pulsates around his eye like it just bruh, 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 like a beating heart and it i'm always like is it gonna explode it doesn't explode but it's gruesome and those the work mm-hmm. of those like um air pockets that they put in over under latex i mean trauma's a master at that it works you know it's not video drone but it's icky and uh, the same with and um, hilarious, but and it doesn't hilarious. make you laugh. Yep. Like all at the same time. It's now. So here's the thing: the the other to me, a great comedy war movie is Tropic Thunder. I really love Tropic Thunder. I'm a huge Ben Stiller fan um, of its writing and his acting, and I think that was a brilliant movie because it pushed buttons, um, but it was still tolerable to the mainstream audience. Even though if you break it down or you take it out of context, it is truly out there um this movie i do feel like in a way is a is a progenitor of that because it did attempt to use that same jungle warfare concept that was so big in the 70s and 80s especially the 80s with rambo uh really rambo two three etc um it used those to comedic effect tropic thunder has some true laugh moments um Troma's War is more of, uh, I'm trying to think of the right term. I think um, John Waters used the term on RuPaul's Drag Race once, a beautiful obscenity. It, that's what this movie is to me. Um, it is, whereas a film like Terror Vision has really interesting characters and it's clearly a satire, this is not, it doesn't feel like a satire. It feels like an homage that they decided to um throw in a blender with a bad 80s sex romp and somehow the jokes got melded and uh and i think it it doesn't it may not work on the level that it's a successful film but i do think it stands unique uh in this in this way and i think that's why because the movie is also known as war just war Isn't yet it also really, known as a thousand ways to die and yep it was released yeah. in the u.s as well as a thousand ways to die and Which, um I, I I was actually thinking about the title and you know maybe I went into the movie the wrong way and when I look at Troma's War which Troma's it's not it's not it, it has an apostrophe it is possessive yes. so it's Troma Entertainment's production of war yeah. um, yes. and you know maybe I should have gone into it thinking in the same way like not another teen movie where yeah you know it's kind of Troma presents a, a, a portrayal of war and it's not going to be accurate and you should know that because it's trauma entertainment that's a very good point because i and i personally and maybe it's because i'm just a sick person but i much would watch trauma's war over any not another teen movie flick or scary movie flick or etc um i'll watch repossessed but we'll go leslie nielsen's <laughs> a different story so we'll but so yes i think that that's an accurate portrayal and for fans of trauma um, Troma does have like this interconnected universe where a lot of the movies take place in Tromaville. Um, and there's Tromaville High, things like that. And uh, I, and this, this movie works in that universe. Um, many of the people are from Tromaville. And, uh, and so it's kind of a nice side story to their Sergeant Kabuki Man NYPD, which of course takes place in New York, but it has connections. Toxic Avenger, which takes place in Tromaville. Um, Here's an interesting story that people who know trauma might find interesting. When I did uh, volunteer, I was the Toxic Avenger. The mask is very tight, at least the one we had. Um, and they didn't have t-shirts for me, but they wanted me to be branded so people wouldn't think that I was just a fan who bought a Toxic Avenger mask or something, or the Toxic Avenger. So, but they did have a lot of Tromaville High bumper stickers. So what they did is they had me turn my own shirt inside out, which was black, and then put a Tromaville high sticker on my front and back, and then made me bracelets, and I think even anklets from the Tromaville bumper stickers for me to wear throughout. And that's how people, and I had a mop. that was, of course, a real mop. And that is how um, people knew that I was with Troma as I wandered throughout the convention. And a surprising number of celebrities wanted pictures with me, which is funny because to me, I'm like, oh, uh, you know, Sid Haig, uh, you know, God rest his soul at this point, but Sid Haig has a picture with me that he wanted taken as Toxic Avenger. And he, he never will know that that was just some schmuck from New Hampshire at the time in that sweating in that toxic avenger mask um side story but yeah i agree the branding of trauma's war is very accurate uh and 
if you just called it war, uh, which I think maybe was the initial intent, sort of like a 1942 or a, um, as you said, a Blazing Saddles, like I think they kind of sometimes go for like a Mel Brooks vibe of um, ridiculous goofball comedy. I don't think it's as accurate and it doesn't work as well because Troma's War, which is the re-release branding, is accurate. It is distinctly a trauma film. And yeah, I think that does put you in the mood if you know what trauma, what trauma's apostrophe S really means. Um, Mandy, how do you feel about the branding of this film? Because when you go into a film called War, as you said, there's not actually a particular war. I think of World War II, I think of large scale conflicts. This is really like an insurgency at best. Yeah, and like at the end they say like it was a war, like we're just in a war. I'm like, it's like a battle, like maybe a skirmish. I don't know where you draw the line there, but I'm like, didn't feel like a war. Um, and it, it definitely just felt like the pilot for Lost. So it, <laughs> in order to bring that up again, I just I, I was like, I I don't understand why this got named this, and I don't know the history of trauma, which thankfully you've filled us all in on through this episode. Uh, but it was just, yeah, I was like, I don't, I don't know. It's just some campy 80s stuff. I'm here for it. It was great. <laughs> so it's interesting that, and I'm sure we, we will, there are so many trauma gems that we can talk about at some point, but getting to the, there's an over, like an overlaying of, of sat, I do think there's an overlaying of satire in this film where it makes fun of 80s action movie shtick right um the hot guy who rescues the girl from the ocean at the beginning and she's like what are you doing why am i topless are you copying a feel essentially and he's like uh i don't know what you're talking about lady i rescued you from the water uh, i can't there's a plane crash in case you didn't notice and she's like still mean and then his response isn't look sorry geez which it would be probably now in a script it's whatever sweet cheeks like uh blah, blah, blah. maybe you'll feel different later like that whole shtick and yet he's the hero right um, and then she saves his butt and he's like, I'm so glad you are, you know, basically a raging bitch. And it's a weird, it's a weird thing. Uh, but the movie, so it sounds sexist and it is sexist in some ways, but it also has a huge number of women in the cast. I'm glad that you brought that up because I mean, I would, I was going to say at some point, I remember that the women do save all the men. Yeah. That's the end they, of the film. And they do. And not only do they save the men, they're actually like pretty badass at the end, right? Like, um, and let's give a shout out to the mom of the baby oh, yeah. who knows like uh, martial arts <laughs> and kills mm -hmm. like many people at one point before she's found her, her miss, you know, her stolen baby again, she strangles an attacker with her baby's onesie and then shoves it in his mouth and beats him to death. Like, and then takes the onesie back. And, and she, like, puts it over her shoulder. Her like shoulder, a like a bird like, cloth. Oh, mom move. Mom yes, move right yes. Yeah. That was, she was, she was far and away my favorite character. Um, and <clears throat> we also, and so the, the women in the movie, and like I said, um, uh, the character of Nancy is a young black girl who, they even mentioned that she starts crying, you know, in the beginning crying and being, upset, and then at the end, she sort of goes on her own to kill the mastermind of this. Um, and she's called the smart one. We don't know why she's called the smart one, to be honest. I'm not sure where they got that, but it is really nice to see a person of color in a movie, especially from the 80s, being called smart. That is great and i feel like this might be the only one um that, that stars white people where they call a black person smart and that's sad that's really sad but trauma put it over in the entirety of hollywood trauma said well we're gonna do it um and i thought that that was nice and uh like i said especially if you look at uh, and the beast, of course, uh, they have people who are trying to be, there's, there's the Caucasian group of Russians and there's the uh, Middle Eastern group of, of Afghanis or people playing Middle Eastern. Um, and so that's maybe not a great example, but in most American action films uh, in the 80s, uh, which is a change from the 70s, it's white people. That's what we see. Uh, and the, the amount of representation is is terrible it's piss poor if you do see black people in most 80s action movies um which is a genre i love but it, they're usually gang members uh and that's it's a generalization uh and it's sad that that was the case and it's bled into the 2000s i mean we don't there's a lot of whitewashing still and we're well aware of it um and hopefully it is changing but it's gonna take time and this movie 
again, heroes, villains, everyone is uh, of color and white. And there's, uh, I believe, some Asian cash members. There are, in fact. And it's just, there are and men and women. And they're all kicking ass. They're all getting killed. It truly is equal opportunity garbage. And that is a really nice, nice thing to see, especially in 1988. Because in the 70s, we did get a nice mix of people. Um, Grindhouse, I feel, was really a great thing for getting people of color on screen and some leading roles as well. And then we took this huge backswing in, in Reagan's 80s. Um, and you know, that's, that's what, that's unfortunately what happened, but, uh, it was nice to see that. So we're going to get to the end here on, uh, with our time, uh, for Troma's War. Mandy, would you recommend Troma's War to anyone? And if so, who and why? I don't know. Did you like Lost? Did you like <laughs> to revisit that in some bizarre previous, possibly current, future i don't even know time warp event like go ahead and watch trauma's war it you know you're probably not gonna laugh but you'll be amused and uh there's an adorable baby the baby's cute you know? greg who would you recommend trauma's war to and why well if you heard us talking about the beast and you're like man this is all really over my head and just a lot of uh you know neoliberal garbage where's where's the good shit um i consider trauma's war a perfect fit for you oh lloyd kaufman is rolling in his grave but also opening his wallet um <laughs> so yeah i i i think that you both on something i think trauma's war is very watchable if overlong um because long. so it, it's it's 140 or it's an hour and 44 minutes not 144 thank god but an hour and 44 minutes so it's only five minutes shorter than the beast but i will say there is no shortage of things happening um there are a lot especially if you're a fan of um low budget gore effects that are a lot better than the true no budget gore effects we often see in direct video or, or excuse me shot on video um give it a watch. If you like the Toxic Avenger, um, this is actually, I think, a progression from the first Toxic Avenger in storytelling uh, for, for Lloyd Kaufman uh, and his crew. And um, there's some interesting bizarreness in this movie. Uh, if you are a war movie buff, this is going to be something really different. And why not? Throw it in there. Uh, it probably would be great sandwiched between uh, Rambo 2 and um, Tropic Thunder, right in the middle. Um, you're going to transition nicely and, uh, and that's going to be something to do. Um, plus this is one of those movies you should probably have on hand. If you like to be like, uh, to your friends who are kind of white bread and vanilla, uh, Hey, you want to see something different? Uh, show them Trauma's war. Um, you know what I, I did, uh, since you said that, I wanted to add in that since, um, if you liked airplane, but you wish it was a little bit, um, closer to the third rail, like Trauma's war, Definitely had some airplane vibes the whole time I was watching. True, true. Uh, it always comes back to Leslie Nielsen. Uh, yeah, so thank you guys so much for listening. This has been another episode of Cult and Classic. As always, we're going to have the Chud play us off with All About Evil. Uh, as a note, the clips played in the show are for review purposes only and are the property of the copyright holders for these films. Please check these films out and support them. If anything we say sounds interesting, then they're worth a watch. And send us your recommendations for films to cultandclassic at gmail.com. Thanks again to Nick for recommending The Beast, a.k.a. The Beast of War. It was great fun. And uh, join our Patreon at patreon.com slash cultandclassicpodcast. Thanks much. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to Colton Classic Podcast. This podcast is important to me, but what's more important are the rights, privileges, and freedom from violence of everyone in this country and in this world. And that means supporting Black Lives Matter. If you'd like to make a donation, please go ahead and visit coltonclassicpodcast.com, where we have a list of places you can donate and help out. And please stay safe.